So, so we know that the feeling that pressure and when we appraise a situation to be sort of above our, our capabilities, we actually have physical changes. Our body changes. Adrenaline and norepinephrine and epinephrine are dumped into our system and get us into that place where we're prepared for the fight. We're prepared to, to battle the charging lion, if you will, mm-hmm. and to uh, fight and kick and run and climb trees and stuff like that. And that's really good if you're faced with a charging lion, but it's not always good when you're doing things from an EMS world. Driving ambulances is not particularly good when you have this complete fight or flight response. Right. Um, doing fine motor dexterity skills like starting IVs and calculating medications is not particularly good when you're in this fight or flight mode. And long-term vision. Absolutely. You know, how, how do you envision this call progressing is lost to that fight or flight? Yeah. Think more about the lion than the overall situation. Right. And, and we talk about perceptual narrowing, or as you mentioned before, the tunnel vision that occurs. Our, our state becomes hyper alert, but not particularly aware. So we focus on the lion, if you will, but not on the things that are going on around us. And that's particularly dangerous when with a leader in mind, because that person has to see all of the things going on in the situation, the threats, the changes, the things like that. But we tend to focus very carefully and very specifically on the threat that's in front of us. And, you know, our bodies don't differentiate stress. It's not like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like what I talk about my, with my students at the registry exam. When you go in and sit in front of that computer, you're feeling that stress in the same way that you would feel it if that was a growling lion. And your body is changing and adapting to fight the growling lion. But what you've got to do is take it back down to a place where you can think and process and be aware, not beat the computer up, because that's not going to work under that circumstance. Although so, it may have been tried. <laughs> I'm sure it has. That, I'm, I'm sure it sure. has. The other big thing that I think we have to think about is it's not just our body that's changing, but it's our brain that's changing. There's some interesting research that's gone on that demonstrates that the chemical makeup of our brain really significantly changes. And it takes us from a level that is characteristically human, and that is being able to value and judge and make good decisions, to a place where we're sort of almost like uh, my dog Henry, where we're sort of easily distracted and the squirrel goes by and he gets hyper alert on the squirrel. And we can show you that the same chemical that is dominant in our brain under that kind of pressure is the chemical that dominates people when they have manic phases of bipolar disorder. So again, hyper alert, but not aware. And that's a dangerous concept when we talk about making decisions. Well, and I think one of the things that makes that even more important is that many times we focus on skills. We think about the skills that we do, but I really think the hallmark of any advanced provider is their knowledge and assessment and thinking. Because most of what we do in EMS, and quite frankly, in emergency medicine, comes down to the assessment and decisions that lead us up to a protocol. Once we get to the protocol, we know what we're going to do. And many of our errors come from bad assessment and coming to the wrong conclusion in a differential diagnosis and choosing the wrong protocol. Yeah. So while we hang up so much on skills, I think why what you're saying is, is probably one of the most important concepts is because the true worth of an ALS provider is good assessment, differential diagnosis, and thinking. Because right. once you get to the protocols, you know what you're supposed to do. It's the journey to get there that really makes an ALS provider an outstanding ALS provider, yet it's the part that can be most affected by our mind and by that stress you talk about. Yeah, yeah. And that pressure, you know, the, the, the pressurized brain loves to anchor. It loves to pick pick something easy and obvious and, and focus on that. It loves us to, there's a, the old saying goes, if, if all you have is a hammer, every problem becomes a nail. We, we've learned algorithms with lots of arrows and bubbles and things like that. And we've drilled them in the lab and we've practiced them in class. So what we want to do when we get under pressure is fit them into one of those algorithms. But uh, as we were talking about before, Dan, you know, our patients don't read those algorithms and the yeah. situations don't always fit into those algorithms. And we have to be very careful to not let the pressurized brain keep us focused in a place that we're not seeing the bigger picture. We could have, as, a, as an AEMT, uh, a patient that's wheezing. It would be very easy to just go down a wheezing path, when in fact there's other things that can cause wheezing besides, say, reactive airway disease. Sure, You sure. know, there's, there's certainly parts of, of heart failure and fluid that can cause Anaphylaxis wheezing. Anaphylaxis and Anaphylaxis. things like that. So if we, if this give an example of anchoring, if we just say wheezing and say, well, I've got something in my toolbox to, to fit that wheezing, we don't have a path. The concept of differential diagnosis, to be able to go through and say, this is the complaint, and then think of all the things that could cause it and apply clinical reasoning to that. 
That's huge. Yeah. So I think it's important that we talk about how we prevent getting into the spot, how we prevent uh, having these effects hamper us too much. Know that there's no way to prevent them totally. I mean, even today, after 30 years, I still get cranked up on calls every once in a while. But the idea is understanding that this is going on and and taking some action to prevent it, I I think, is really important, uh, an important first step. I think perhaps the one thing that that I would give as advice to every new advanced life support person coming out into the field is to realize that it's okay not to be an expert and that expertise is a, a pathway that takes years and, and hundreds of calls before you feel uh, even close to becoming on that pathway. It's okay to be where you are. It's okay to be an advanced beginner. And it's okay to understand that not everything you see will be easily uh, fixed and be easily interpreted. And what you want to be able to do is use the resources that are in front of you. I think sometimes we make a big mistake in, in, in teaching people to say, well, you can't ever use resources. You can't use calculators. You can't. Well, that, that's all that's doing is saying it's on your shoulders. It's, you've only got one shot when, in fact, you can use that kind of stuff. And if you're coming to my house and taking care of my kids, I want you to use a calculator to come up with the proper dose or the proper math to, to do the job that you're doing. And I think in the regard of, of EMS, we're often put out there without a lot of practice. Physicians have internships and, and residencies, and we don't have that. We've already said that you may finish your class, and we've got an opening Tuesday night, and, and you know, you're going to be out there. You're going to do that. And I think it's very important, both for longevity and peace of mind, is to be kind to yourself and recognize that advanced beginner status. Mistakes are made in medicine, every level. Physicians, nurses, paramedics, AEMTs, EMTs, I mean, everyone will make an error. And fortunately, not all of those are life-threatening. But they're also they're not career-ending. That perfection in the beginning is, is not going to happen. And I really want to tell people to be kind to themselves. And I think it drives a lot of people out of the game when they don't get out there and feel perfect all the time. But, but they're not going to be. Just be kind to yourself out there. Work with conscience and, and, and try and do really well. But no, it's not going to be perfect. That advanced beginner is a, is a wonderful way to put that. Yeah, yeah. And also interpret the situation in a, in a realistic way. Appraise the situation properly. There are very few situations in EMS where you only have one shot. Right. There are very few decisions that you have to make where it's absolutely life or death. And I'm not saying it can't happen, but I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and really not too often does that really occur. And if there's a problem in the advanced life support skills and thinking, Doing good BLS is always the way to go. Right. You know, just remember that if your patient is ventilated and is circulating blood and is, you know, prevented from getting further injury, you know, it might not be perfect, but you're still winning. They're not getting worse. Right. So don't forget that BLS anchor when, when we need to. I think the other way to sort of prevent this is, of course, to train properly. Right. And, um, you know, this, this comes from a, a good licensure program. And I hope you're, if you're an instructor, you're listening to this to talk about sort of realistic training and putting people into stressful situations before they get into the field and face these problems. You know, the, the old saying is train like you fight. Yep. And if you're creating situations in class that are requiring decisions to be made and, and, and observation and changes, you know, the challenge that we have in licensure programs is we give you the, the same old situation all the time where you walk in the room and say BSI is seen as safe and somehow Wait, those magical your hands words. In the air. We both did the same thing and that's how we train. And there's also no concept of time in that. That's right. You know, you go through and you spout off all these things that you do. You do verbal diarrhea and cover all these things. And there's really no reality, no true practice for the street. Right. And right. that's, that's we need to, you talk about train the way you fight. It's a concept, you know, practice the way you play the game or play the game the way you practice. Right, right. And, and when you learned how to drive a car, no one gave you a list of the 25 steps you need to learn to drive the car. You got in the car and you did it. And that experiential learning is really important as we train new ALS providers because that's going to be give them the tools to, to have that critical thinking and to think on their feet uh, when they're faced with these situations that don't quite fit into the algorithm that they learned in uh, in their class. So th- I think that's really important stuff. I think the other thing that that does is allow them to sort of process things at a meta-competence level. Competence means being able to start the IV. Competence means knowing the dose. But the reality of, of how we screw stuff up in the field is it's not the competence piece, although certainly we make those mistakes, but it's the time when we don't know when or why or or what the reason is to do that. So focusing some training on that level is a really important element as well. 
people who aren't confident are hesitant to make decisions that lead them into other things. For example, an advanced life support provider may say, I'm not sure this patient needs an IV because they're a little hesitant on whether they can really give the medication or not. That this good to practice these entry level decisions. Should I you know, apply the monitor. Should I start an IV? Should I give a NEB? Whatever it happens to be, that that confidence is important because that also links with confidence. People who aren't confident won't make those decisions and go ahead. And it's really important to practice those in class. Yeah. But but what about the person that didn't have that opportunity to to practice that in class? And, you know, unfortunately not everybody can go to a a fantastically forward EMT program or AMT program like Like, like ours. Like ours, right. right. Um, (laughs) But, but remember that there's lots of ways to fix this problem. There's lots of ways to train, and it doesn't always have to involve million-dollar sim labs. Right. Um, simply the art of mental rehearsal can yes. do a lot of these things. Um, I think you can do that by yourself, but even better, you take a person that has a little bit more understanding than you do, and you sit across the table and say, let's talk about these situations. And you visualize in your head, and you uh, go over the steps that would be necessary to make decisions. This is the tailboard chat, the, hey, I saw that the, the call was really tricky. To, let's talk about how we how you made the right decisions. All that kind of stuff is at our fingertips and is very powerful in terms of preparing you for these more challenging situations. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. The mental rehearsal, going through those things in your head will definitely help you uh, when you get to see the real thing. Yeah. I think it's a great suggestion. EMS is full of low use, high risk situations. Yeah. You know, the, the, the idea of uh, 90% boredom for 10%, you know, absolute fear. And that's sort of where we are. And the reality for a lot of the skills, especially, but a lot of the critical decisions is no one's learning these things on the job. No one is learning neonatal resuscitation by doing it over and over and over again, unless you're very in a very unique situation. But that doesn't mean you can't sit at the table and rehearse a neonate resuscitation. It doesn't mean you can't sit at the table and talk about a really challenging decision and, and practice for the day that it does come. And back to just an earlier comment, your decision on whether or not to start a line or whether or not to give a neb, you may look back and say, say, well, I would do that differently next time, but many times the patient's still going to come out okay. Yeah. And I think it's important to recognize that that these decisions we look at as life and death, and we certainly want to help the patient relieve any stress or suffering or, or pain and, and make them better. But the truth is, is that we're going to drive them to the hospital and get them to care. And the stuff that we do in between um, is a work in progress. Yeah.